crowded room makes me very happy. Um, and we have a very special guest today with us, Florentina Holzinger, to my right already. Already a warm applause, please. <laughs> and as always, before I introduce you, a uh, um, quick recap of last week, because we had our first group work. Uh, which was very beautiful to see. I mean, I, I was observing them from the outside. Um, Twelve groups um, were made within, uh, you know, the entire seminar. Eight of them have sent me their information. So there is four ambassadors who suck at their job. So um, whoever these four are, please send me the information. And then the name, whatever uh, the study is, and the email. So please do send it to me by tomorrow, all 12 groups. Eight groups I have, so if you have sent me the information, never mind this. If you haven't, please do by tomorrow. Um, I see many guests in the audience also uh, beyond uh, the, the student body, that's fantastic. And, um, and then we will think also um, what we do actually within these groups. You had your homework, who of you did the five-year plan, by the way? <coughs> Are you shy or is it only three people in the whole room? Okay, please do it. So the, the homework of last week was write a five-year plan where you want to be in November of 2027. Emotionally, physically, professionally, whatever, but it really helps you kind of, it's good to set small goals. So please, please do take that serious. It's also a wonderful thing to do over in between the years. You know, it's a very reflective moment. Think about it. Uh, it will take you further. Um, other than that, um, let's come to you, Florentina. I'm super excited uh, that you're here, actually with everyone that I invite here. It's a bit of a fanboy moment. I always uh, already said that to you. <laughs> I'm a great admirer of your work. Um, yesterday evening you had a performance, uh, a, a play at the Volksbühne. Today you're here. Uh, it's a great honor. So for those of you that are not familiar with Florentina yet, Florentina Holzinger is a yeah, performance artist, performance maker, a choreographer who uh, has um, uh, shaken the international like performance scene uh, for many years now, has enriched the international scene um, with many award-winning uh, pieces that um, are a dizzling, um, a dizzling uh, combination of uh, classical elements from dance and ballet, but also from martial arts, from acrobatics, from uh, numerous um, pop cultural references, art, or artistical reference, dance references. So it's a um, very collage-like work, and where uh, I guess the impetus, impetus is that of a very direct confrontation, an almost radical confrontation, also with the body, in particular with the female body, uh, with the nudity of the body, and, um, and and one of these kind of moments when you go to the theater and you really leave with having never seen anything like that before. Um, so thank you for kind of provoking and, and pushing the scene for so many years like this. And thank you even more for being here. And now the stage is yours. And, and again, a warm applause for Florentina, please. Thank you. Um, hi. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out to listen to me. What an honor. <laughs> um, um, I will really, since, since Lucas told me that you all come from all different kinds of disciplines and ways of life somehow, I will, I will keep it kind of general but but let's see um but yeah uh and 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 it was it's important for me is that you really also shoot with questions in the moment if you should have have any and but i will anyways make 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 time also i don't know after half an hour or something to 45 minutes to do so that you can can ask your questions because I mean there is so much that I could say and at the same time it's not so clear for me what is really important to say <laughs> so um, yeah so it's amazing if you help me a little bit with finding out what's actually interesting for you to know um, and and I will I will just uh, 
keep it now, I guess, pretty biographical. <laughs> um, so that you get a little bit where I come from and how the work developed and how I ended up where I ended up. And of course, I don't really know how many of you are really familiar with the work. Maybe you can indicate that by raising your arm just so I know how much I need to describe things really. Okay, so maybe 50-50 or something like that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will. I also have some images prepared, but please don't expect a full-blown PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. I don't have anything like that. Um, yeah, since I guess it's nice to have some pictures, and obviously, if you have not seen any of the work, you should come to the Volksbühne in December. <laughs> um, <coughs> Yeah, because you know, uh, I'm 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 really uh, coming from live performance, so I think I can talk my mouth fussily about it. But it's important to see it actually to really get it. Um, yeah, and also I mean, yeah, it's kind of weird that I'm stuck behind this laptop because there is not much gonna happen <laughs> here. <laughs> you I mean, yeah, what am I gonna do walking around? <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, maybe I'll walk around. <laughs> no, I, I felt actually more comfortable here. Um, so I will start from back in the 90s when I was born. I come from Vienna. I was born there. Um, I, I guess I'm... I mean, it's, it's, it's in Germany that they really treat me like an Austrian. <laughs> But um, like it happens to a lot of artists in Austria, you only arise to fame there <laughs> if you have a reason to fame in other countries. <laughs> and th that kind of propelled me at a certain moment back into my homelands. But what was very important for me was to leave Austria uh, and kind of still is, to be honest. Um, so my, my art path, um, started pretty late actually in my yeah at the end of high school when yeah when I did not really know what to do and suddenly fell in love with dance in a weird way but kind of late because I was really not um, I, d I, d I did never have a dance dream and not a, and for sure not a ballerina dream I more came from actually sports but everything very much on an amateur level um, and and I actually my first contact with dance was really creative dancing as in somebody putting on music and you just being able to do whatever the fuck you want on that and that was at that moment in my life a revelation and I found out that you can actually study this and it's called contemporary dance and th this kind of made me really want to embark on that journey. But back then, it was not so easy as it, as it is now, where it's very obvious that one doesn't need any dance background to study dance, in the contemporary dance circuit, I mean. Um, but, but you had to go through castings where you had to do actually your, a ballet class and then a contemporary class, and then you had to probably show a solo, something like that. So I, I tried to prepare myself for something like this, and that was the, f the the only time where I really took something like ballet serious in order to prepare to to yeah to survive something like a casting actually. Uh, anyways, no school took me <laughs> because I mean, even for contemporary dance, my body was a little bit weird in the sense of that it looked awkward when I was there at the ballet bar and stuff, and I would I would most of the time not make it further into like the creative part of the selection processes. So the only school that then took me um, was the School for New Dance Development in Amsterdam. And yeah, and that was, uh, and I only realized that actually when I, when I w arrived there that this was a choreography school and not a dance school because what I wanted to become was a virtuosic dancer that was sweating a lot on stage and th that was not happening there. This was really, uh, you were held from the very beginning to do 
proposal for the stage to develop your own kind of dance. And that meant really absolutely nothing to me at this moment in my life because I felt I didn't have the tools for that and what, what should I do? And people were lying around on the floor and trying to feel inside of themselves. And that was like one of the er uh, schools that really started with, you know, like uh, looking beyond the form in dance and, and, and going very much into the body, like with through met methods like body-mind centering and just things that are all over uh, any dance education at this moment as well, actually, but, but they were kind of early with this. And um, yeah, to be honest, I just thought that my f colleagues were smelly and hairy and did not really know how to dance. <laughs> <laughs> and I smoked a lot of weed and then after a year I actually suddenly <laughs> realized that I like to do my own shows and kind of that was the beginning of the disaster. <laughs> I mean, of that moment where I kind of, yeah, I, I, th that's why it's not really that I say that I chose for making works or something like that, but um, I really was forced to do it because, uh, because kind of, yeah, this, what I in had envisioned for myself, it, it did not really open itself for me, um, I would say. And obviously now I'm really happy about this because I never had to go for a casting and I never had to, I don't know, be in a work that I hate and all these kind of things I never had to do and kind of so in retrospective I'm of course happy that I can do just my own shit actually. Um, um, but yeah, uh, uh, so, so pretty early everything was about yeah, how do you make something out of nothing? That's how uh, the, the dance work felt to me in that moment. And Obviously, and, and really, I mean, I just want to be honest with you guys, <laughs> the people, um, that when people nowadays ask me about the nudity and why everything is naked on the stage, I actually lie a little bit to them. <laughs> but to be honest, when you are coming from a school where <laughs> you are held to do something out of nothing, it might be a good idea to take off your clothes, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Because then at least there is something to look at. And I mean, now, of course, I constructed a lot of concepts around this, which are also important. But it really comes also from the place of like doing something out of nothing and then having your own body just as the only thing that you have. And, and I mean, I found actually immense pleasure in that. And that's where kind of I started my research with uh, yeah, the body, I call it the body as a machine for special effects, actually, because, um, yeah, in a dance training, you might learn how to uh, lift your leg in a certain way and this kind of things, but there's endless possibilities of uh, research on the body and with the body, and I take this really fucking serious, I must say. Um, but, th but yeah, that's where it kind of this... Yeah, I mean, b because of my education, I guess there was never a hierarchy bec between what is called the formal and then the, you know, the inner body thing. Like that was clear for me that all of that can be choreography and the, the, the body is not just the form that it takes, but uh, it involves also the insides of the, bodies, uh, the, of the body and stuff like this. Um, but yeah, um, I, I would still say that I, yeah, that I, that the body is somehow this tool that I, that I try to really um, take serious as this yeah, machine for special <laughs> effects and what are the possibilities of it. And also, uh, yeah, in relation to kind of certain expectations that are being placed on a, on a body, potentially. Um, yeah, so it was not such a stretch to call actually the first show kind of plus for Scheiße. Um, so no applause for shit and um, it kind of happened that this show made it on some type of a market, the dance market <laughs> and that all of a sudden I actually could make money with that which came as a surprise to me but it was um, because the show itself, I mean it was really kind of applause for shice. it was a little bit a piss take on what you could make money with on a stage. <laughs> um, but 
uh, and, and I mean, I'm not so cynical now about art anymore as I was back then. Um, but but this was kind of an interesting starting point. So um, when when now uh, people expect that. Um, the some yeah sometimes people now because I'm on the big stages and with the big productions they think that I think that art is holy or something like that but I really come from a place where where yeah where it's clear for me that also the shit deserves to be there and probably should be there and when when yeah kind of when the press tells me yeah but all of this money that is there and this and that production then I'm still thinking yeah but this is the money that you should fucking waste you know um, and it's n and it's nothing compared to you know the money that big corporations are dealing with so give me a break um, so uh, I, I f for me when I was in art school it helped me actually to really work with my fellow colleagues and I had a very tight working collaboration with a colleague of mine with Vincent Riebeck and our first creations they happened together and this kind of helped me because we did not have to owe anything to anybody but we really did the things that we wanted to do together and explore physically together somehow um, and, and, and like a succession of works came into being that came out of this collaboration and that's kind of plus for Scheisse um, then it was spirit in succession of that, and I mean, I don't even remember myself, this is so long ago, Schönheitsabend. Um, all works that were already, were the topics around sexuality and representation of gender and stuff were very important, and where we already touched also slightly on things like the ballet world, because um, amongst others, but I just want to explain this with the ballet, because for me it was always interesting to find even topics or also c particular contexts that um, that give a certain resistance somehow. So out of all of the dance world, of course, the ballet I felt the most removed from and uh, I, I mean the most um, estranged by and the most excluded by, I guess, in a certain way. Um, so that's why I'm still fucking stuck with the belly, because it uh, just offers a very nice surface to rub against, <laughs> and and that's a good starting point for work. Um, and and because it's such a tight container, I mean, of things, <coughs> and um, and because I mean, uh, one of the major topics in the, in the works at the moment is this, yeah, issues around like disciplining the body and really training the body and. Um, showing certain mechanisms of training, but also dealing a lot with uh, with actually dance and art history and with the notion of tradition, and um, yeah, and coming really from a dance education and stuff, it always interested me how much like certain ideas that we find like in the classical ballet world that we now, of course, my generation does not really go to watch ballets really seriously. I mean, um, some people do, of course, but um, what 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 those have an e effect on us still, and how bodies are read on stage, or what people expect, uh, what is their notion of virtuosity, of skill as a dancer, and these kind of things, um, and uh, yeah, this. Um, this obsession with the belly, it really culminated in tanz. I don't know how many have seen tanz. It's kind of an old show by now, but uh, but it, you cannot really say that because it, COVID was in between, so it's not that old. <laughs> um, but that was really kind of the close, everything that I still wanted to say about this topic of tanz and about tradition and the effect that it had like on the body somehow. And obviously, um, another topic that is very important for me, which is to unveil things and make things transparent. And somehow the idea of the nudity, after all, is really also to show things and show things at work and not hide things somehow. And, uh, and belly, which is all really about the illusion of things and creating illusion of lightness specifically and of uh, weightlessness and this kind of 
topics yeah was very interesting for me to unveil somehow and <coughs> and to yeah to talk really about yeah what are the things that we are not supposed to see or know actually about um for example a certain dance technique when we watch it as a watcher and and i mean that's not just about dance but that's i guess what's also my obsession with like stunting for example for movies or for television that um that I'm more interested in seeing the person being pulled by the rope than than seeing what ends up than in the nice Hollywood flick where we just see, see the body being, I don't know, thrown out of a window or something like that. So I'm really a fan of analyzing mechanisms and how um, how illusion is being made, actually. And um, yeah, and also maybe to, to say that, that for me, um, I guess I'm semi-critical with these things because also with the ballet, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's important for me to really be busy with things that I really like. So I do really like the ballet, but it's not a piss take per se. I do take it serious, but yeah, I want to show certain things that are actually important for the form to be not shown. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and of course, with with something like the classical ballet, what played in there, or also with something like stunting, is the whole question about yeah, affliction of violence on the body, body, I guess, and what what what, and and suggested pain on the stage, like what is the difference of the pain of? I mean, in dance, it's very banal, right? It's what is the. Um, the performer that suspends themselves by the hooks w through the skin, like is that a similar pain uh, as the pain of the ballet dancer in the point shoe or something like that? Or what is the, and what does training have to do with that, really? Um, and yeah, also a bit who is in control of the body and who has the right to decide how a body treats itself. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, um, maybe it's important to mention uh, that I did have <laughs> a stage accident, a really bad one, um, after 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 my early works, I would say. Um, so still still before Tanz, um, but but kind of that was the closing of this collaboration, also with with the other artist. And um, it was uh, obviously still in a moment where my productional frame was much more limited, as in I did not have uh, the help that I have now with like technical <laughs> in technical regards. And I mean, I had my myself also much more a, a punk attitude because it was just about me and my body, and I wanted to try out crazy shit. And um, that led to f falling from the ceiling basically during a show and waking up in the hospital. So that's kind of the nightmare of what can happen for an audience in a show. <laughs> but very interesting <laughs> also. <laughs> um, uh, but that did make me re-evaluate a lot of things about performing, about how I treat with my own body, of course. Um, but to be honest, the effect that it had is that it made me want to turn myself into a machine. And that's where really my journey into the martial arts really started. And that's still something that on a philosophical level is very important for me, also in the work that I do. That I have a pretty martial arts attitude of doing things. So when people ask me about uh, violence and stuff like that, it's not that I'm scared of that. I, it's just I see it... Um, it's it's something that can be trained and that can be disciplined in order to be used wisely, if you know what I mean. Like, this is important for me not to shy away from that, and that's not about violence only, but violence is just an, a kind of taboo topic, <laughs> I would say. So this counts for all of complicated topics. I'm... I'm 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 ready to go into things like like it is a sport and where the rules are very clear for everybody who, who is participating. Um, and I guess that has helped me to not be scared to do things that a lot of other people are scared doing on this sta on the stage, for example. Um, yeah, and where a certain freedom uh, comes from, I think. And um, yeah, but but I mean, anyway. So after this accident, when I wanted to become a machine, 
I really did not want to be an artist, obviously. And <laughs> and I, yeah, and I really wanted to become an athlete, actually. Um, but that really didn't last th that long. I mean, I really went into it, and then and then I got bored of it, as you can imagine. Like it's uh, the life of an athlete is is no nah, whatever not judgment but but it was too much of the same thing and and uh, and obviously i have problem no not obviously i have a problem with authority and with other people telling me what's good and what's not good so then sport is not the right thing <laughs> um but i mean yeah I, I do love sports because i mean i employ it a lot in my shows and stuff and the, all the choreographic aspects of sports i love and uh, and uh, and i work a lot with athletes but yeah, happy not to be an athlete myself. Um, and by the way, this is something that I started really teaching a lot also, and especially artists, like um, going into the ring and, and boxing and kickboxing, a lot of this kind of stuff. And when, when, when I'm teaching um, in, in schools, uh, in art schools or something, usually the base of uh, all teaching will be, will be uh, boxing training. Um, because because uh, because it's a great equalizer of a group and it's <coughs> very accessible for all kinds of <laughs> levels of yeah um, physical abilities and these kind of things and because I think it's very healthy to practice confrontation in an art context <laughs> in a relaxed and cool way. Um, yeah, but for this we don't have time today. <laughs> sadly. Uh, um, so, let's talk a little bit about the later works, because what happened with Tanz is that it got, got picked up right by the German theater, and I guess that's why <laughs> I'm here in Berlin at the moment. Um, and, um, yeah, because that kind of led, I think, to this also that René invited me on the Volksbühne, and now I'm there like artist in residence since two years, I think, something like that. And it was, of course, it wa I come really from the free scene. I usually developed my projects with raising money myself, uh, building up my team. And I mean, we are growing together in that sense. Like I'm working with the same core team of people already for yeah, the last seven years or something. So, so it's really not only me. I mean, um, uh, it's it's really uh, like people that that I'm working on the set and on the design and on the music and on these kind of things already now for for multiple shows and it's very important for me because um, yeah f it's always it's kind of it's always about the same thing but I just like to go deeper and deeper and deeper into things um, and for me usually really one works. Um, brings the urgency of something else that still needs to be dealt with somehow and that's how the next work will will happen so uh, that's why I also don't find myself that's why my five-year plan is also <laughs> fucked up in the sense of that I hope I'm in five years really somewhere where I cannot imagine now and yeah probably now that the first <laughs> minute um, uh, maybe yes, but you know, I mean, I really like, I like to be in the flow. And um, and I like to to take new possibilities and new challenges and and be uh, in different places and spaces and, wi and with different people and stuff like that. <coughs> um, yeah, and, and I, yeah. And, um, yeah, I was scared of the Volksbühne because it's a it's a fucking institution, it's a city theater, and for me as a freelance artist, that meant a lot of compromise. And I don't know for the people who have seen of Ophelia, um, that was war <laughs> with the institution. <laughs> um, but but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, we got what we wanted. <laughs> um, so I mean, as I said, I come from really a place where I tried everything that I felt like trying, for example, with my own body, and I did not need to ask 10 Bühnenmeister for a permission 
to try things and then also give 20 signatures if somebody wants to do this or that. I mean, the bureaucratic machine is immense and it takes the sexiness of things out in an instant. Plus, it's a lot of money. Suddenly, the budget is doubled because 30 people need to give their okay for the fart on the stage. And this has been really very uh, um, annoying. Really, that I almost wanted. Uh, and I mean, uh, so for the ones who have seen of Ophelia, um, and I cannot really compare it to Divine, but, but it is complicated a little bit technically. I mean, there is, a, uh, we do employ a lot of rigging mechanisms. We do work a lot with circus effects in a certain way. I mean, it is technically difficult. And uh, so it is an immense challenge for those people. And of course, I mean, for me coming from freelance and having assembled my own team, and for example, also my own team of, my own team, no, but like experts in things like rigging issues. I mean, people who really come from the stunting industry. It is frustrating that then I have to rely on an unwilling Bühnenmeister from the Volksbühne to rig me in a safe way if it could be somebody who has just rigged Keanu Reeves for Matrix. <laughs> um, so, so this or other things that I cannot even talk about because then it's got a shitstorm immediately. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old house with old people. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, um, huh, I, I mean, obviously it is a big privilege to be there in the house. I mean, don't let me, let me not uh, be somehow pathetic about this. Um, and, and we really made this show for this space. I mean, where uh, that's why we cannot tour it, because you cannot hang this helicopter anywhere else. I mean, you don't get it through any door <laughs> of any other <laughs> theater. But yeah, we really made it for there. Um, but that's a bit the paradox for of houses f like that. They are kind of constructed in a way that you have like this five million chain hoists on the ceiling, but then you're supposed to not use them somehow. Only Kastov was allowed to use them. But, but yeah, I kind of pushed for it, but it was really hard. And I mean, up until, yeah, I mean, no, I really, I really don't want to go into detail about it. <laughs> um, all the audience interaction we do illegally, because we're actually not allowed to do it, because the insurances are just going berserk with these kind of things. I always say, I know this person. <laughs> I have to say that. I know this person. It's a friend. <laughs> like, I employed her. <laughs> so. Need to lie a little bit. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, the, the, yeah, after Tanz there was Divine, which is kind of this, this work of the, of the Divine Comedy, right? Of, of the Dante Divine Comedy. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. What's the time? Okay, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> no, because I think this is maybe important. I just want to say something about the motorized objects. And then we, yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know who of you saw the Divine Comedy because that was actually the first work that we really did there at the Volksbühne. And there we, and, and yeah. And uh, because this is something that also grew important in the work somehow. I mean, we started already with Tanz to, to be very interested in elevating things from the floor. Because somehow, um, yeah, when you take the most banal thing from the floor and you elevate it, it becomes this sublime, um, heavenly object. And I mean, of course, this was very much inspired by these ideas. I mean, obviously super old school ideas of like heaven and hell and those binaries of the Divine Comedy. 
um, where we really wanted to take the things from the floor and lift them up and through that they get charged with this other meaning and become this psychedelic heavenly object and kind of this has happened, I mean, th this is why we do work a lot with cars and with this kind of things, o also because there is a certain um, f funny thing about that they are so, yeah, this uh, uh, charged with certain male and machoist fantasies somehow that we like to own also a lot in the shows. And, and I guess also because uh, I like to see this as an extension of the body as this this um yeah technological objects in general and um i did uh, yeah i did a lot of um yeah so in divine we also have the the the, the cars and now in ophelia it's the, it's the helicopter but what is another thing that is very important for me to do parallel to this really stage productions is uh, something that we call etudes so I don't know who of you have had a, have a childhood in the piano world or is even pianist themselves. And etude is a technical difficulty, right? That gets like repeatedly trained, a übung, somehow. And and in the public spaces, we do a lot of these übungen. Um, so for example, for the disappearing Berlin and uh, for the for the Schinkel Pavilion, um, that was also another übung. Uh, which which is something where I take this really serious is using the body as a as an instrument and playing it, and um, and uh, I think the first etude was an etude for yeah ten bodies and a car also, and there we really exercised like cra we we employed a lot of te um, techniques from stunting so crashing against walls and creating a beat like this, but to really make musical pieces with the body, but in, in a very literal sense, through crashes and things like that, or um, stunts. Uh, may that be with, yeah, um, with, with cars or with flying objects or in the water um, or things like that. So that is still, still something that, I, that, I, that we really push forward this etude somehow and, and that, that, it, that, has, that is very different for us than the work on the stage where we kind of repeat certain shows, but this is really our playground to experiment and, and do once in a lifetime things um, and propositions. I will show now really quickly some images, right? Um, yeah, let's start with... No, I mean, I just showed tons because that's kind of the so show pony. It's what makes my money. <coughs> because it's my cheapest work. And that's why, I, and it can tour. <laughs> um, fuck, full screen. <coughs> uh, sorry, this Deutsch is... Okay. Um... Yeah, so, so this is really the ballet piece, right? And you see there the lady with the hooks, she will fly in the end because that was, I was really busy there with the uh, human body in flight and like this ultra human wish to fly, which is like one of the first ideas of dance in general. So the dance, it's, yeah, dance is a means to learn how to fly somehow. Um, yeah, and there is, uh, and, 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 and really the topic of suspension, which, which is super important in all of the works, actually, and which, yeah, I'm always interested in going away from the floor yeah. somehow. So there I'm working with, I was really casting people who I thought were uh, these experts in suspension and different means how to lift the body off the floor, to, to bring further somehow this idea from the ballet, yeah. Where they where they become these fairies that are flying, and I mean also there you see I mean here we have the motorcycles which was for me more like the urban broomstick because the romantic ballets are full of the witches right, but yeah we didn't wanna be on broomsticks so that's the 21st century broomstick. Um, yeah, there there was for me d talking about this tradition and stuff this multi generational approach. I don't only do it for because it reads good in funding applications, but it is important because uh, yeah, for me it's important to talk to somebody who m has the perspective from let's say 80 years ago on yeah what what dance was then and how that relates to what dance is now, 
And of course, also because like um, body images are changing by the second, seriously. So it's interesting to 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 have these perspectives from different dec decades and and centuries, even. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, divine maybe, just because we uh, talked a little bit about it now. That was the Dante show, so this was a serious kind of negotiation of life and death, but just because I was always interested into this danse macabre uh, sujet somehow, and the dance of death, and obviously the problem of representation that we have in dance, like how can we really dance death? I mean, I had danced the dance of death in my accident to, but I could not repeat that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this was somehow, yeah, um, I mean, obviously that's very explicit here with the skeletons on the back, that's the classic danse macabre. And, and it was more that we called it than Divine Comedy f um, inspired by Dante because we had this topographic element somehow, the stairs and a lot of up and downs and um, yeah, the cars again, but there they are more actually this altar object because it's kind of the the frame is that we are organizing a funeral for one of our dancers and orchestrating a funeral for one of our dan uh, for our uh, eldest performer, and uh, and the cars are there more like these altar objects and they will also go up and become kind of these angels of death <laughs> in a certain way, and I mean yeah. Um, the the hurdles again we have there some elements from sports but m really more metaphorically about this overcoming of things <laughs> and uh, and the, the the motorcycle is somehow yeah the it's also actually there the presence of death in a certain way um, yeah. So, uh, so divine comedy is more like different proposition of dances of death. It's not really that we go down the circles of hell and then up the circles into paradise because obviously these binaries are redundant and what hell is for one might be paradise for the other. So we really yeah, exercise that and celebrate that in a certain way. Um, <coughs> yeah, and what comes up must come down. I mean, that was for me the idea, idea of the stage that it flips, that so everything that is on the on the floor in the beginning kind of flips and like the piano is first on the floor and then it flips and, and we can uh, and we look at it from above somehow. Um, yeah, I would say that's, uh, that's this show is pretty much s s s yeah, spectacle <laughs> somehow. <laughs> it's very fast. It's 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 very different from something like Ophelia, where I really dared to use text. I I come from a place where I really hated text, and I mean, guilty of hating text theater. But I was forced to deal with the Volksbühne still as a haven for text theater, and also I got really upset by the fucking theater critiques after Divine where they were like, but who was Dante, and who was Virgil, and who exactly was, in which circle of hell was this? So for Ophelia, I made it really fucking clear. <laughs> there is even a glossar, a dramaturge made me do a glossar, <laughs> where it's written uh, the story of Ariel, the story of like the sirens, the Melusine, the all of these um, Characters that we are obviously really busy with, but not in a literal sense of that we are trying to tell narratives that people anyways know from a Disney movie. But uh, I had to do that for the German theater crit critique so they get what it is about. <laughs> um, because, I mean, Ophelia is really our water show and, uh, and like was on my wish list for a long, long time. Um, and and I thought somehow when Volksman asked me to be the artist in residence that that was gonna be easy because I mean 
um, the Volksbühne, no, this you can really let it in like a badewanne. Um, I mean, people think it is deeper because we are acting so well as if it was deep, but it is 30 centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but still, it's warm water. And I mean, the we are not the first. I mean, this was constructed to be used in that way because in Sprechtheater, they love to have there a little pond that they never ever set foot into, but wander around the pond and deliver some text. <laughs> so um, we, of course, like to go into the water. <laughs> and, and I mean, that was, that's what brought us really into the water idea. We were like, okay, there's the possibility. I mean, let's use it. Let's, I mean, yeah, fucking dream for anybody, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, then it was still like, of course, I mean, water is every theater's nightmare. Let's be honest about it. And I mean, we flooded the Volksbühne once and we thought we destroyed it. And then we didn't, <laughs> we and then thankfully there was the set design of another artist <laughs> in the cellar and it caught the water, like tons of water, <laughs> through its set <laughs> and saved the Volksbühne, the machinery of the Volksbühne. <laughs> but the artist, yeah, that's not a... G didn't turn out to be the best relationship <laughs> after that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, and also there, it's not that I have a super mermaid obsession or something like this, but on the other hand, who has not? <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, and, and it was interesting for us to really go through the sirens and the Ophelias and all of these ladies in the old museums that are drowning beings, helpless and in their most beautiful space, uh, in their most beautiful form when they are dead. <laughs> and um, this drowning thing was just a lot of fun for me and my cast to train. And uh, of course I'm huge I'm a huge magic fan, in case I have not mentioned that, and, and a huge Houdini admirer. And so that was, um, there were so many things in the show that were for me and my cast really things that we are really passionate about. <laughs> um, yeah, like up Noah training and really going for the free diving and really learning how to be under the water. And, and this is uh, really important for me in all of the shows that I find something that that is really, I mean, I do kind of, sounds like I'm lying, but it's actually true. I do wake up in the morning and I think, what do I, what, how would I really want to move today? What is the type of training also I want to do? Or maybe I don't want to train at all, but um, at that moment it was really, ah, the apnoe could be a really, really interesting thing to get into. And it might be useful in certain apocalyptic visions that I also like to indulge on to learn how to stay under the water really <laughs> long. <laughs> and um, and I guess, yeah, we are there busy with, yeah, going through this whole art history and this Halbwesen and what they really mean for us and wha what, what this means even for <coughs> us body image wise and so on. Um, but then also really go for water and like certain ecological topics in relation to that, but also utopic topics and going even into science fiction with, yeah, like what if training to become another species actually, like a Kiemen Atma. Um, and, um, and yeah, because we wanted to have this very explicitly on the stage was also our first, uh, our first show to have kids as representatives of the other generation in the show and of course because we liked that this was also complicated because people had always told me yeah but kids i mean uh how how are you gonna have that in a show where you also deal with topics ar around sexuality and so on and we actually found out that it was super cool to have very open conversations with these kids about what this show is really about and um yeah also very funny conversations with a lot of child psychologists <laughs> <laughs> who define what is kindergerecht and what not, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, and then also, and, uh, and then 
also the s to be busy with really with the psychology of water and what the water as an element really means. So the, the, that was really a super bunch project of ours somehow to do. Um, yeah, I just show quickly some images. There we have, of course, we have all of these water stories also that kind of come up from the ground through the water. So the leader, of course, a lot of, uh, yeah, then we are uh, most of the time this sailor, n not most of the time, but we are this um, drunken sailor posse that is kind of <coughs> representing, yeah, um, this the, the male counter type to this mermaid character, but also like the, <laughs> yeah, explorers that are kind of colonizing and this kind of things. Um, and then in the, yeah, th 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 that is kind of the dystopia somehow. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, there is of course the helicopter uh, um, saving, yeah, I mean, but m one of the most interesting things we did for the show was we really went to train in places where they train um, people who work on oil platforms, what in case of a fire on an oil platform and how to save yourself, so um, they tr train there, like what if a helicopter picks you up and then of course shit happens and the helicopter also crashes into the water and how you uh, save yourself then from under the water. Um, so, so really we were busy with a lot of survival trainings for this show. And I mean, then we had this 30 centimeter pool to deal with, so not everything made it into the show, but that's something that, yeah, we have some actions planned on, on real water and stuff like that. Um, yeah, the Houdini, of course. Ah, the talent show. I mean, that's why it's called Ophelia's Got Talent, right? It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, f it's Ophelia gets cr recruited in the talent show in a certain way. A lot of fishing, a lot of Schiller and Goethe and Forella and, and like this, yeah, romantic uh, theater references about the sea and the water. Um... <coughs> I'm ready for questions. Well, you put that wonderful <laughs> image. You want to put that wonderful image of the helicopter as the backdrop? Yeah, Lucas, yeah. Yeah, you want to use the mic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Because we are all naked and there is something to look at. <laughs> no, it's, 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 no it's, yes, but it's an incredible. I no, mean, I know. I mean, it's what an image. That's, yeah, what can you say? What exactly. <laughs> so I would say warm applause. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Uh, this was really, really uh, amazing and very inspiring, and I also uh, love that you really started without the images and told your story. So I'm sure, knowing uh, our Monday crowd by now, there's a lot of questions. Uh, I'll break the ice with the first one. And it's an incredible image, by the way, no? I mean, can we have another applause, please? <laughs> one more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and the artist. <laughs> Um, I, have a, I, I don't even know where I should start with my questions, but since we have this <coughs> image of a lot of people now engaging with a machine, uh, and you, you talked about this briefly, but could you elaborate maybe also to the st uh, students here a little bit more about your team structure? You mentioned that you work with the same group of people or the core team for seven years. Yeah. Some are dealing with the stage design, others with music, um, and so forth and so on. Um, yeah, so. Could you elaborate a little bit on that team effort and also the team structure that I would be curious about? How, how we can imagine that and how you guys work together once you start. Let's say Ophelia. Yeah. You call all six and say, hey, let's get together. I want to do something about mermaids. No. Or, or yes, that's the question. Um, no, I mean, I mean, by now it is that, that, we, that, <laughs> that we get things offered more and that then we are looking for certain things that would make sense to do in that space somehow. And I mean, depending on the, yeah, if it is a state show, that's something different than if when Kraftwerk asks to do something for the atonal or something. Mm. But, um, but for a show, I mean, I, I guess compared to other uh, theater makers, 
and for sure René Polish, and I mean that led to some misunderstandings in the beginning. I do work very long on things, and I actually, I mean, I would, something like Ophelia, I do max once in two years. And, and for example, the Volkswagen, they wanted me not to do productions every year, but I don't have that capacity, and I don't want to also. Um, and, and, we, and we do spend a lot of time on the conceptual phase, and I would say that I have quite a clear image of what the show will be at the moment bef when, I, when I go with real bodies into a rehearsal situation, really. Mm. And also, the casting is super important for me because I look always very specifically for the people that suit into a certain project. So, for example, in Tanz, where I was really busy with this question of can we learn how to fly through dance, I was looking for people who can fly, and that was not so easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and on the other hand, when I have them, I'm like, okay, there's the show. Because they bring then their own expertise into the show, and that's, not, that's something that then already exists. So a lot of the things that we do in the show, people bring also from their own work. And, and, and I mean, in terms of cast, there is always a mix. There is a mix between the people with who I already w have a long working history and, and uh, the new people that are necessary to really nail that topic. So, so for example, for Ophelia, I was really looking for people who are, who are really busy with the water in their own practice. And I mean, I was looking for divers. I was looking for people who work like in the Cirque du Soleil for crazy water shows and um, um, yeah, people who, or, or, or swimming teachers. I mean, people who, that's important <coughs> that we can teach each other stuff. So I was really uh, looking specifically for those kind of people, for Ophelia, for example. And um, yeah, and then it is, I mean, as you probably all know, um, yeah, when you are an artist that is touring shows a lot, it comes in very handy to have a lot of friends in your cast because otherwise you get fucking depressed that you spend half of the year in hotel rooms. Yeah, I mean, you need to have a social life also. Mm. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's why 50% of the cast, it's only friendship casting. Mm. <laughs> like people with who you can spend time with. And then they can be untalented, <laughs> and then 50%, 50% <laughs> <laughs> of them, they can be assholes, but need to be fucking talented. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it is very important, of course, for shows like ours that, that, that the group is very good <coughs> with each other, because otherwise this would just blow up. Um, but, but kind of, yeah. That's the that's the, the, the casting <coughs> composition somehow. And I mean, generally, um, I, I love to have longer working history with people because, as you all know, like there, this is very complex. The nudity and and like uh, people always ask me the questions of who asks who to do what about the like um, harshest things. Like we have a lot of body piercings on the stage and things like that, or inflictive things, where it's super important that people bring this really from themselves or ideally from their own work into the work actually. Mm. And how do you challenge these different knowledges, experiences? I mean, you as quote unquote the director. Like how do you mean? The, the, the knowledge of the swimmer or the diver and you said they all, they're always connected to the topic that you're dealing with, whether it's elevating from the ground or it's water. Yeah. And how do you challenge now, or the channel, sorry, challenge these different no knowledges and experiences in the well, in uh, the making of the piece. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, how I channel it. <laughs> well, I mean... Um, how do you use it, for the lack of a better word? Or make use of it? No, I mean, I make by the things that we end up doing in the shows. Mm. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, as I said, like, already this that we are teaching to each other um, how to stay under the water longer, mm. or how to make a really nice kapfla. Um, uh, and, and I mean, no, I mean, there is also this, uh, some things, the talent show that we have in Ophelia, fun fact, those are all people who really go to talent shows. <laughs> mm. So I mean, the, these acts were almost pre-existing, and then of course we tweaked it a little bit. So that's then a lot, I guess, how I channel it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
and I tweak it more and I tweak it less. Mm. Depends. <laughs> mm. um, and maybe not all of them are like real talent show acts, but you can guess which one are not and which are. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, but uh, but this is super cool for me. I mean, to to work with people who really come from these disciplines. I, I mean, that's really where I see myself different from the conventional theater approach. That for me, this I would not do a talent show if I had to act a fucking talent show. Mm. I mean, <coughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, sweet. Okay, now. Um, First questions from the audience. Who wants, who dares first? <laughs> yes, please. Um, And speak up loud. Uh, yeah. uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering uh, uh, what you have to say about all of these uh, uh, automotive elements, like the helicopters, the motorbikes, the cars, uh, because uh, I mean, it's an aesthetic uh, that I'm uh, very fascinated by. A number of reasons, and so I wanted to know how yeah. you feel about it. Yeah. Did you hear the question in the back? Okay, the reference to all the automotive elements, the cars, the helicopters, the <coughs> motorcycles, like why? Because also him, he's drawn to this kind of aesthetic. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's drawn a bit to this aesthetic, and that's why I ended up using that aesthetic also. But, um, and at the same time, everybody knows that, uh, that they represent also something, yeah, probably, uh, yeah, I mean, the car is like the symbol of like <laughs> capitalism in general and uh, fucked up climate and so on. So, I, so or of ca like certain macho aesthetics that I can be critical of and I can be very passionate about because I mean, I am a big fan Uh, of action movies and 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 I work a lot with stunt people and when I go to uh, to the places where those people train <laughs> everywhere hangs a motorcycle and a car and and sometimes we can't come into these places and I mean so for tons we are working with um, yeah it doesn't matter but I mean we came into the studio and there was the hanging motorcycle and then I thought that's an urban broomstick <laughs> you know But um, but but kind of just because we were surrounded by these aesthetics and we thought it's uh, uh, I mean at the same time also ah it's very pretty at the same time and of course um, uh, it's it's fun for us of course also to fuck up these car vixens um, but but it is a love I mean it is it is both of that that's uh, that's just what I what I wanted to say. Mm. Um, Yeah, and as I said, at the same time, it is also the thing in the in the stunting, same as on the on the stage. Um, the first thing that you have to do, you take all of the inner things of these cars <laughs> out because of fire regulations, etc. So this is anyways not a car anymore, you know. Like the you take all of the all of the thing that gives it the power, you take it out. Either that it's light enough that you can lift it or that it's not catching fire and burning up a theater. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, I find this interesting somehow. You take all of that evil stuff out and it becomes this shell and, it's some and then you lift it and, and you move it or you move in it in a not functional way, it becomes something different. Mm. Sweet. Yeah, I see a lot of questions. I start, there was the first hand raised. Yes, you, and you have to speak up very loud. Repeat this just in case. What draw, drew you to the story of Ophelia? And what did you want to convey, convey with it? Thank you. Um, no, I mean, first of all, that Ophelia is kind of this predecessor of the of the mermaid fairy tale. I mean, she gets described as this mermaid-like figure. But I mean, also know that they, this uh, Shakespearean assumption of that she belongs to the water, and she um, so I mean her destiny is to drown, and that in the stories, as I said before, she is the most sexually attractive in the moment where she is a corpse, mm -hmm. um, and inspired like fantasies over 
centuries. I mean, like we find this everywhere, no? The depictions of the Ophelia or of the dead corpses that they fished out of the sand, which is kind of a fam um, same family. Um, and I mean, this helplessness <coughs> associated with femininity in that Victorian times and, and, uh, and beyond that. And I mean, that was still for us interesting in what this could have to do with us now and certain gender notions and so on. And, that, and, and I mean, yeah, I feel you know, I'm repeating myself a, a little bit, but I was like, no, because the real question is so, there is quite a mystery around Ophelia's death. Like, was she killed? Did she kill herself? Actually, she gets depicted as in the wa she belonged to the water, so she just um, got one with the water. There was no, not even any violence involved, but also not a death struggle of hers. Um, so we thought, ah, that's an interesting training that, yeah, and to train drowning in that way somehow. <laughs> Sweet, and then I think uh, I saw you with the white hat, but then there was another question raised quicker. Yes, maybe there. Oh, much, much louder. How do you work with your team? Yeah. I mean, it keeps changing huh? because the productional circumstances are changing all the time. So maybe I try to find a real life example. So, for example, now uh, an, an opera house approached me to do an opera. Did I imagine to do an opera ever? No. I don't even like opera. Like, who can listen to this singing for longer than half an hour? I cannot. <laughs> It's painful. <laughs> but at the same time, of course, so I looked for, is there an opera that is shorter than half an hour? <laughs> and there is. And of course, like, there are reoccurring issue, uh, topics in opera. So I mean, then I started my research into the opera. I was like, is there something interesting there? And then I found, of course, all of these non-operas. No operas that are really about like, the possession of the nun, the sexual obsession of the nuns with Jesus Christ. And I mean, and and then they're immediately. I mean, it's a little bit like the mermaid. It's a it's <laughs> fetish. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's like super camp, obviously. But um, but yeah, there are so many interesting topics there, and and uh, and super, this is highly physical. I mean, if you really think about the the cannibalistic <coughs> ideas of the church of devouring the body of Christ and stuff. I mean, there are endless interesting things for me <laughs> about it. <laughs> And um, and then I, I and then I I start thinking pretty soon with my with my set designer and I mean this sounds old school but you know I had to at a certain moment credit him that but I mean that's somebody who thinks together with me about making constructions for bodies to be I mean we we really do set design that is needed so that the body con can do certain things. Um, that was the big disappointment of the workshops of Volkswagen that they thought that we just need like cardboard trees or something, but we said no, we need a helicopter and it's not just there to look at, but we need to climb on it. We need to fuck it, in <laughs> fact. <laughs> and um, this means something completely different. <laughs> so, so then uh, we will think, yeah, how the fuck do we get a helicopter? And, 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 and how can we do this safely also? I mean, there are so many. That's then one of the first things we are actually busy with. So right now it's then more to <laughs> what, um, how would a church look like? <laughs> Things like that. And like, how could a, a, a yeah, I don't, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. But I mean, uh, and, and of course also, uh, sound is super important so my with the people with who I work with sound I mean in Divine Comedy was my first show where I really worked with live musicians and with like original compositions and stuff because I'm pretty copy paste um, but but uh, but yeah uh, 
that's the first people that I get around actually, like people who are busy with like set and sound. Mm -hmm. And along that, the, 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 the concept of the show gets developed un until I end up inviting the right people for it. Then first, um, with the white hat on. I was just going to ask what role does sound actually play in the That's a continuation, basically. Yeah. What role does sound play? So you can pick what up. What role? Yeah, sound. Um, um, no, I mean, we work a lot. Um, yeah, we work a lot with this, the sound that bodies make in certain, uh, yeah. I mean, like in Ophelia, I don't know if, if, if you notice, but there is quite an emphasis of like making up the water itself. And, and, um, but, uh, but you know, I mean, I'm, you know, they assign me to the, the uh, artist that has a lot of pop cultural references. So, um, obviously, I, uh, there is always some trash sound wise also in the shows. But um, but but I work with a lot of musicians also on the sound, and as I said, like we particularly spend a lot of effort in making up the actions that happen on the stage and making a sound score out of that. And I mean, particularly obvi obviously in the etudes, because those are meant to be really mm. musical compositions with the body. Um, but but also in all of the other shows, actually. Mm. And Dio, you raised your hand. It's, ki it's kind of similar, but in terms of like stage design. And mm -hmm. how much control do you, or how much of a vision do you have of what you want to say with Ophelia, it's what you wanted the set to look like? Or how much was it the, the person who did the stage design? What's the like, back and forth? Yeah, no. I repeat it this for the last row, just quickly. This is the acoustic situation. Same question about stage design. So now we talk the role of sound, and now again a bit more in detail on the notion of the spatial design. No? Yeah. No, I mean, for us it's important everything that is on the, sp on the stage really has a function, like a physical function, and is there to be used in a certain way, like, like any object in a gym would be when you enter a gym. Um, uh, and, and it goes, we work very close around this, and I, I say, ah, okay, um, we want to be practicing escaping under the water, so what to co kind of container do we need to, to perform a classic Houdini act that, that is like a escape from chains under the water, for example, and then we construct it together. So it's, yeah, we do this really, yeah, the idea and then what needs to be uh, constructed for that. And I see another question, actually, uh, uh, <coughs> blonde curly hair, yes, you. <laughs> and again, very loud. Yeah, I was in the first time, and I was wondering how you narrate the story, because I was feeling sometimes people were this thing again mm -hmm. uh, it's regarding Ophelia a show that she saw and uh, it felt like some parts felt very authentic uh, by the actress and is the emerging of fictional elements and actually biographical elements of the actresses on stage yeah did you mean sentimental in like a bad way em emotional, <laughs> no sentimental <I> think. <laughs> pathetic mm. <laughs> is that what you meant I read it more as emotional so yeah okay authentic <laughs> just <you>. checking yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there are for sure pathetic things in there. <laughs> but it was, uh, that's what I mean. I mean, that was important. For me, it's really not important to dig up the fucking Shakespearean Ophelia, but, um, but to find in our own biographies where this Ophelia things um, had an effect on us, really. Um, and, and I mean, usually we are not... Yeah, I mean, Captain Hook is probably playing some kind of a role, but it's not that, w I mean, everybody is uh, pretty much themselves on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and yeah so so yeah for sure that's important also that we share a lot our experiences in mm. and bringing that uh, into the into the present mm. and very last row i think blue jacket yeah and then you uh, can you say something about So it's talking about imperfection <coughs> and mm -hmm. that it seems like consciously that they're not perfect movements, um, but of there's the notion of imperfection that you play on and this in relationship to the idea of opera. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we do strive for perfection. <laughs> 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 I will go back to the studio. <laughs> 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 No, I mean, obviously, I have a relaxed attitude towards uh, the notion of failure and stuff like that. And I mean, I do like to aim for the virtuosic, but probably it interests me more to aim for the virtuosic and the unexpected things rather than in um, the tendue that is perfectly executed. Um, and, and I mean, I... I, tr I tried to not have a super amateuristic attitude, attitude towards things, but that, uh, that things do look like a serious practice. But then, of course, I also need to fake a lot of things often. Um, and also, at the same time, I, it's very important to... Yeah, to, no, I mean, to question the notion of virtuosity uh, and stuff. I mean, I like to do spectacles, but I mean, I'm probably much more a fan of the anti-spectacle than the spectacle, which is also a spectacle. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So th there are certain things for me that are very important that they are highly perfected, like it's, just really important that she really manages to get the squirt onto the exact last uh, chord of the Sacre de Printemps. And that's for sure much more important to me than that the legs are up here next to the ear. But it could be also important, you know, that's then not everything can be perfect. Maybe I can, um, I, I saw the question there, but I have one question that I want to follow up myself. Because uh, I was thinking about when you talked about the etude, you talked about the virtuosity, uh, the experts. There's a lot of um, focus on the training. And yeah. also in connection to, you mentioned in the beginning, the background of sports, martial arts. You actually had this very nice saying of that boxing is actually good to kind of learn confrontation in the artistic context uh, earlier in your presentation. Mm -hmm. But you're go going back to the notion of training, because this all might seem super <laughs> wild and you are so much things going on. But this must be there must be enormous amount of precision and training behind everything, and yeah. how you keep that balance in kind of this spectacle you mentioned uh, circus references, where it seems imperfect or wild, yet it must be super perfected or uh, yeah the, the the level of precision in the training. I would be curious about really the, what the training looks like for you guys. Yeah. No, I mean, different for different people, of course, according to what they have to do in the show somehow. But I mean, we do, uh, yeah, yeah, really a bit like a dance company in that sense that, uh, that there is um, a lot of the time that we spend in the studio is dedicated to the, the particular trainings that people have to do. And I mean, not everything then, um, yeah, I mean, but, but really also different people need them, different uh, kinds of trainings according to what they what they do in the show. So I mean, for Philia, that was some people spent a lot of time in the water or, or were really actively pra uh, practicing the breath holds and stuff like this. <coughs> and um, yeah, and uh, other people trained their other things. But for example, for dance, where we really had the, yeah, we were having a ballet class uh, more or less every day to, yeah, to really to get it right somehow. And I mean, then still, uh, for somebody who comes from the ballet world, uh, half a year of training, that doesn't mean much, but that's, uh, yeah, that it can mean a lot. Mm. But, but yeah, I mean, 
Um, yeah. No, but usually people bring in really uh, a year long experience with the things that they do into the work, and that is important for it also. But as I said, there is also like this momentum that we teach to each other a lot, so not, mm, yeah. So not everything can be perfected in that I way. I have two more questions. And first, the one behind you, actually, yeah. the, uh, and then you. So three more questions, one, two, and three, and then it comes to an end. So you go first. No, the gentleman. I, I think you went before me. It's OK, never mind. OK, but I, okay, I can also ask, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that you, the, the reason you decided to incorporate more text elements later was that it partially in response to reviews uh, that you got for the Divine Comedy, and I just want to ask how, like, to what extent do you read reviews, and how much does, or how much do you care? Really? Yeah. If for the back row, uh, how much does she care about criticism or reviews, yeah. and whether you actually read it or not? No, I mean, I was, uh, I was exaggerating a little bit, saying that that was the only reason to employ text in that show. Um, I can like text, but but uh, but there needs to be other things to look at at the same time. <laughs> um, I d I mean I don't I don't read reviews because I mean I was born with bad reviews to be honest. Uh, in in the sense of that when we did Canaplus for Scheisse, I mean no I mean my reviews are a book. I mean they are very funny of course because uh, all that people mention in reviews are usually the very explicit scenes. And it it becomes very nice poetry if you read it, but um, <laughs> but uh, and I mean uh, you know the problem uh, I the problem of a lot of people who write, for example, these German theater reviews is that they cannot place experimental work and they cannot really place uh, dance also, um, so. So I really, uh, in that sense, my work made this shift of really belonging to the dance scene, to the theater world, and the theater world didn't know how to name things, really. Um, or the theater world much more asked for, the, for, for this very explicit aboutness and content of things, and they get very confused about narratives and things like that. Um, so, no, but, uh, well, I, I actually do not read reviews, but you know the Volksbühne, since it's a theater, they have this wall where they like to put up all of the reviews. <laughs> and then I pass by and kind of subconsciously I read a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I read reviews for the YOLO, you know, because they are very funny. Mm. Then please, you. Yeah. I, I have a million questions. Can I ask two? <laughs> or is cheating? <laughs> no, no, no. I have a technical one, which is like, uh, how do you work with your group in terms of, do you create the scores, who makes the decisions, like, um, do you decide all together sometimes, or you have something specific in your mind? And the second question is, you said that you were more cynical with art, and you're not so much anymore, and wh what do you mean with that? Okay, for the back <coughs> row, again, question about the working structure, um, again, more in detail, and then you mentioned that you're we're more cynical with the arts and you're not mm. as cynical anymore. What do yeah. you mean with that? Um, okay, first, first the first. Um, no, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, as I said, like before I really go with, uh, with bodies into the studio, I do have a certain clear idea actually why people are there. They are there for a certain purpose. I mean, most of the time, let's say. Um, and kind of, I'm, then we work together pretty soon on scenes. But of course, a lot happens then still, because I mean, then, I mean, you, you compose it together. And I mean, often also, I mean, I'm, I'm working with people who are all uh, artists themselves, and m most of them do their own works and stuff, so, um, a lot of the times people just go off and work by themselves on what they what they do then in the show. Mm. I mean I give them I give them like my idea and then yeah. 
But of course, um, yeah, some things get made like this, and other things they just <coughs> come out of the air during rehearsals by uh, improvising. But I'm not the big improviser, generally speaking. Mm. And now the cynical. The cynical. No, I mean, <laughs> I w I mean. Uh, no, I'm just thinking I cannot be that cynical after all because now 10 years later, what am I doing still, you know? Um, and I, I and, and I mean, I'm, yeah, and uh, me subjectively, of course, I have the feeling that I'm quite, that I got more and more uh, conventional also in a certain way because I'm, uh, I make uh, formal decisions that I would have previ before never that I would have never done. I mean, for me, it was a big step. I mean, I am in all of my works, for example, and when I was still working in a smaller setup, I could feel from the inside what a show is. And that was for me the most important, because what feels good must be good. <laughs> mm. But then as the shows grew, I lost perspective from the inside and I ended up stepping outside of the shows and looking at it and saying, ah, this would look better if you go a bit more to the left, <laughs> mm. you know? And a little bit, I was always very critical of an approach to work like that. But at the same time, of course, I like this now very much. This, I mean, the shows are very aesthetical. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's also a pleasure to really compose the image. So, yeah. yeah. But this has not so much to do with the cynicism. I mean, I still, yeah. But and then maybe the, that was a lie. the last question from the audience, from Mitra Lankov in the back. Um, yeah, you mentioned working with the Schinke Tower, yeah? Um, and also, I remember, if I remember it right, you did a performance this year uh, in collaboration with a quite big uh, art gallery. So I'm interested in your way of your interest in this kind of different art scene, let's call it fine art world or whatever yeah. you name it. Um, is there any plan like to go into this or what's your interest in that? I or don't, uh, you know, Did I... Did you all hear the question? Mm -hmm. the, 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 he was asking the move also from theater to into the world of fine art, for example as in the Schinkel Pavilion when you did the Pink Donuts or there was another uh, collaboration with the gallery mentioned, so that, yeah, what's the trajectory there? Let's put that picture, no? Because that yeah. was also some and great <laughs> picture. It's an amazing picture. The gender reveal. <laughs> um, oh, for me, it really doesn't matter if I'm in an art gallery or in a theater. It really depends on what are the conditions, you know? And what can I, is it, is it, um, is it interesting in that sense? So what was really interesting about this is that there I did not have to sign any papers to do this. Can you, I mean, at the Volksbühne, this would have never, <coughs> never, ever happened, that you can really uh, drift with a car when there are people standing around and um, kind of make your own. I mean, I'm not saying that it was, I, I, we worked there with, with really good stunt people, just saying. That was, uh, but 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 still, that would have been a fucking hassle to do in the in the <coughs> context of like city theater. Um, that made that, and and I mean, yeah. So that determines where I where I do the work. It's not that I, I don't care if people call me then a visual artist or a dancer or, or a theater maker or a performance artist. Mm. And then I think there's a million questions uh, alone in my head. Uh, I would love to dive into the, you said you're a copy-paste type of worker. I would love to dive into this part. I would love to dive also more into the influences, uh, like where you take these choreographies from. I heard an interview said sometimes it's YouTube kind of videos where you take choreographies or inspired by. Uh, so there's a million things, uh, but we don't have the time for that and I have to uh, apologize on behalf of the UDK. It's cold in here, isn't it? Like my t the tip of my nose is like literally frozen. Um, anyways, um, but we have um, uh, always one last question and that is um, for uh, the students here um, that are coming from different backgrounds, so we'll go in different directions. A final piece of advice. <laughs> Um, a final piece of advice, Jesus Christ. 
Ähm, ja, ja, yeah, excuse the simplicity of that advice. Um, no, I think it's very good to really um, know in in the work that you do. I think it's it's very good that you that you acknowledge all of the freedom that you have and really dare to do things if you can do them and and not um, and and rather try something and then evaluate before overthinking it and never getting into action. Um, so in general, I would encourage to um, f fill your artistic practice with a sense of activity. May that be a physical one or a mental one. Mm -hmm. But I also really suggest a physical activity, I must be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. This is the moment where we say thank you and a huge applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. And a big applause to you and to our incredible team. Um, thank you so much for the honesty, for the openness, for sharing all of this. It's been a pleasure. Thank and you. Uh, see you all, I don't know, in, I have to look in the calendar next week, in two weeks, <laughs> I forgot. But anyway, see you soon. And again, the, the ambassadors of the four teams that haven't sent me the details, do it by tomorrow.